morning at the early service, I got to see some people I hadn't seen in a long time. And then the second service today, I got to see some people we haven't seen in a long time. So welcome and welcome if you're here visiting. We're just so glad you could be with us. And we just go through the day of being in the Lord's house. And uh, Pastor Jeremiah shared with you today. Amen. Welcome, church. Isn't it wonderful to be in the house of the Lord this morning? We are so thankful that you're here. We're thankful if you're listening to us on the radio or watching online. We are so thankful that you're here as well. Just kind of a couple of announcements, and all of these are found in your bulletin. So I encourage you to look at your bulletin. Make sure you're circling, highlighting, whatever it might be. Just a couple of things that are happening. First, if you are going to be part of the women's luncheon, that is going to happen immediately following this service, okay? So if you have a ticket for that, make sure that you head downstairs after this service, and you're going to have a great time together, uh, learning more about the Lord and fellowshipping. Tonight, we are finishing up our Biblical Counseling Mini Conference. That's going to be from 5 to 6.30. So if you were here yesterday, make sure you come back. If you weren't here yesterday, you can still come tonight. It's free from 5 to 6.30. We're going to be talking about communication and family relationships. So we're going to be talking about what that looks like and how to counsel others in that as well. We're also going to have church council this week on Tuesday at 6 o'clock. So if you're part of church council, please go on your calendars for 6 o'clock on Tuesday. Next Sunday is also really significant. We're going to have a business meeting following the second service. So make sure to stay for a business meeting next Sunday. And then we have an SMT, our next Sunday night theology. And that's going to be talking about, I think, the biggest existential question of our day, and that is the issue of transgenderism. So we'll be here from 5.30 to 7.30 next Sunday night. I've added 30 minutes because it's a big topic, okay? So come back next Sunday night for that, and we'll learn what the Bible has to say about an important issue. And then finally, if you are a teacher, Sunday school teacher, a uh, Bible study teacher, a WANA teacher, uh, whatever teacher you are, if you're teaching the gospel in some form or fashion, on May 2nd, we have our next teacher training. So that's going to be immediately followed the second service as well. So we have a lot of things happening in our church. There's the announcements. Make sure that you're putting it on your calendar, and we'll look forward to seeing you at each and every one of those. I want to start our service now with a song that speaks about who our God is and what we've been called to do. So you probably know this song. It's Psalm chapter 19, verse 14. And the psalmist just says so clearly and simply, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. We are here because Christ is our rock and our redeemer. Let's go to that redeemer in prayer and let's celebrate that rock here this morning. Reverend, Father, this morning during the prayer, we got to know a couple things about loved ones that I said in the same front row at their funerals. I'm just thanking you that they have hope. They have eternal life in your son's name, Jesus. That his name is mighty to save, and that he did conquer the grave. So, Father, just everything we do this morning, may it be perfect to your ears. Father, just come to you, we worship you, and thank you for all that you've given us. Father, be with Pastor Jeremiah as he brings your word to us, Lord. Father, just accept everything that you're going to give to me this morning as we worship. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. We have gathered together because the grace of God has entered our life and given us life in Him. Amen. We're going to be talking about faith today, and as we prepare to talk about faith, uh, our congregational scripture confession comes from Ephesians 2, where the first four or three verses talk about how we were dead in our sins, and yet God has done something to give us life, and we respond to this through faith. So let us affirm together the gospel of faith through grace through faith from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 10. Would you say it with me? But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him. 
in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Thank you. You may be seated. Because we serve a wonderful God who loves us and has done everything necessary to give us life, we need to praise him and worship him this morning. We're going to do that now by submitting to him in prayer. So let's go to our Lord and our Savior in prayer this morning. Father, it's a cold and brisk, rainy day here. And as we have come and entered into your house, where many saints have gathered together to sing, to pray, to read your word, and hear your word faithfully proclaimed, it's good for us to take even just a moment to quiet our hearts before you. Father, on Sundays especially, we're just running ragged, having to run as quickly to the next thing. How often we fail to just stop and consider the goodness of the God that we are gathered here to worship. We have just talked about how good it is when the Spirit is working in the body of Christ, how good it is when saints have gathered together to worship you. And so, Father, as we do that here this morning, we ask that your Spirit work within our midst so that the things of lesser significance fade away out of our minds and the things of eternal significance are at the forefront of our thoughts. Father, whatever our week has looked like that's led up to today, for some of us filled with great highs, others of us tremendous lows, whatever it might be, Lord, will you work within us so that we might cling to Christ in this moment? that Christ might be so beautiful that he might be the object of our desire that nothing else is needed but Christ himself. So that no matter what happens this afternoon and tomorrow and for the rest of our lives, Christ is enough. Christ, that's what your word tells us. Will you help us to believe it, to have faith in it, and to trust you to trust that you are enough in life and in death. And so, Father, for anyone who's here this morning, either physically here in this place or joining with us on the radio or online, Father, if there be anyone who does not have confidence that they are resting in Christ because grace that has demonstrated faith in their life bringing them into a right relationship with Jesus Christ. If there be anyone who doesn't have this, then Lord, might you do a redemptive work in their heart right now. Might they rightly examine their spiritual condition to see that they are lacking something that can be given to them. Might they look only to Jesus so that no more is it about being good, no more is it about being moral, no longer is it about being doing good things. It's about Christ. It's about Christ. It's about Christ. Lord, will your spirit bring many sons and daughters to repentance today. And those who are in Christ, 
Might we not neglect the means of grace through your word that teaches us about you? Might we be real about the faith? Not just an add-on for Sunday and then going back to reality, but the faith in Christ is our reality because we're changed in Christ. Father, will you strengthen believers in the faith today? Father, will you strengthen other churches in our area in the faith as well? Father, we pray for Antioch Baptist Church. We pray for Broadway Baptist Church. Specifically, these churches this morning, Father, will you strengthen them in the faith so that the word that is proclaimed is faithful to you and that there's power in the word that is spoken. That those churches might become powerhouses of the gospel. Lord, you can do that. We pray for your work to be successful. So the churches here might proclaim the gospel faithfully. Father, we pray for our own brothers and sisters who aren't able to be here this morning. Father, for those who are in nursing care facilities or homebound, Father, might you work powerfully in their hearts in this moment to let them know that you are using them in their spheres of influence, whatever it might be, to proclaim the gospel, to live out the gospel, and to share with others what Christ has done. Father, we lift up those who are either in the hospital or recently home from the hospital. Lord, we lift up our brother, Don Huffines, to you as he is still in the hospital recovering from surgery. Father, we thank you that by all signs this, the surgery was successful, and that he's doing better. Lord, we pray for physical strength to be given to this dear brother in Christ. And we pray even more than that for spiritual strength so that as he is talking with nurses and doctors and healthcare professionals, that he might model Christ and speak of Christ so that many might hear about Christ in that area. Lord, we pray to you for this Donna Ward that she's home from her knee surgery. Father, we too pray for physical strength for her, but that she might also be strengthened spiritually to proclaim your goodness to her as she recovers from that surgery. Father, thank you that we as your people are not alone, but in Christ we have hope that surpasses all understanding. So as we, as a body of Christ, worship you this morning, might you receive glory and honor. Might we declare your resurrection to the nations. And Father, might we be used to be a part of your kingdom so that when you return and make all things new, we might joyously celebrate in the victory of the return of the King. Father, we pray all of these things in the wonderful, resurrected name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Father, my goal is to be more than just mere words that sound pretty in a song. We have just sung that you are all to us. Father, might the confession of our mouths be true of the confession of our hearts. And as we consider what true faith is in Jesus Christ this morning, might you work powerfully so that the lost, those who are dead in their sins, might be alive in Christ today. And those who are in Christ, Christ might be magnified so that there's nothing more that we need than our Savior. And that we entrust today and eternity to Him. But that can only happen through your Spirit's work. So, Father, might I decrease, so Christ might increase. Might your Spirit proclaim a better word than I could ever speak. And might our hearts be warmed and impassioned pray this in that wonderful, beautiful, perfect name of Jesus Christ and all of God's people said, Amen. Well, friends, if you have your Bibles, would you open them with me to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, we're going to be considering 
the verses of verses 8 through 11. And let me set the stage for what we're going to be talking about here this morning, what is in our text. One thing that I've learned out of life, hopefully I've learned more than just this one thing, but I've certainly learned this, is that what you believe is going to change or affect or determine what you do. Your beliefs of what you believe about people, the world around you, good, evil, better, best, worst, all of that is going to change or it's going to govern, it's going to decide how you do things. Let me just prove this to you very quickly. If you have a financial advisor that you trust deeply, and that financial advisor says, hey, you need to put all of your stock over here or all of your finances over here. If you believe that person, what are you going to do? You're going to put your funds over there, right? If your best friend who just loves food and is very, very good at knowing what is good food says, you've got to try that restaurant. You believe your friend, and so you go eat at that restaurant. Of course, those are perhaps silly analogies. Here's a bigger one. There have been cultures throughout human history that believe that the gods that they serve, the pagan gods, require a blood sacrifice. And so because of that belief, they sacrifice their children. What you believe will always affect and change and even determine what you do. And so the title of the sermon and the thinking of what Paul's getting at here this morning is very simple. Who do you believe? Who do you believe? How you answer that question, particularly in relation to God and to man and to what God has done for man, what you believe about God is going to change everything about what you do, not just on Sunday morning, but every aspect of your life. And so we're in the middle of the sermon series called The Marks of a Healthy Church. If you've been here before, you know what we're doing. You're tired of me saying it. We are going over, this is what a healthy church looks like when following God's word. And we talked about the gospel in depth for four weeks. We talked about this is what the healthy church knows and proclaims about the gospel. But last week and today, we now have asked, what does it look like to respond to the gospel? So we have the good news of Jesus Christ and this eternal plan of God and everything that Jesus has done to die on the cross work through the resurrection to give life. How should you and I respond to it? Last week, we talked about repentance. If you were here last week, we talked about there must be repentance for your sins that put Jesus Christ on that cross. Today, we're going to talk about the twin truth to that. It's this idea called faith. And let me make a cl uh, clarifying statement here. These two are not separated, repentance and faith. These two are twin truths that happen synonymously with one another. When grace, as we'll see here in a little bit, enters your life, you are repenting of sins by believing in Jesus Christ. These two are happening at the same time when redemption is happening in your heart. Does that make sense? And so what we're talking about this morning is a healthy Biblically led church not only knows the gospel, but has personally responded rightly to the gospel and proclaimed to others, this is how you must respond to the gospel as well. So with all that being said, let me give you the main idea, the big idea that we're going to be considering this morning, and then we're going to turn to our text and consider what Paul will tell us. This is our big idea. This is the first uh, blanks in your notes. Saving faith wholeheartedly believes in Jesus alone for eternal salvation. Saving faith, what we're going to be talking about this morning, wholeheartedly, that word is intentional, but your whole heart believes in Jesus alone. That you're believing only in Jesus for your eternal redemption, your eternal atonement, your eternal salvation. And that's what Paul is going to be getting at here in Romans chapter 10. We're going to start reading in verse 8. It's going to start on a question. I'm going to explain what Paul's doing just here in a moment, but let me read to you the text, and then I'll explain what's happening here. Romans chapter 10, starting in verse 8. We'll go through verse 11. Paul says, but what does it say? And he quotes from Deuteronomy. The word is near you, in your mouth, and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we are preaching. 
Verse 9, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Verse 10, for with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. And then he ties it together here in verse 11 by saying, for the scripture says, and he quotes from Isaiah, Whoever believes in him, that's the Messiah, that's Jesus, whoever believes in Jesus will not be disappointed. Or another way of putting that is, will not be put to shame. This is the word of the Lord. May his name be eternally praised. The first main point here that we're going to be considering, and this is going to be a big part of what we're considering this morning, is what is this thing called faith? And so the first main point is titled, The Features of of faith, the characteristics, the descriptions. What do we need to know about faith? Presumably, if we're in Christ, we are claiming that faith. So what does this faith look like? Before I give you some of those features here in our text, let me give you the answer to verse 8. It's hard to start a text on a question. Uh, because Paul did not start on a question. He's been arguing his case for now 10 and a half chapters. And so what's going on when he says in verse 8, but what does it say? What is he talking about? Well, we need to know the antecedent or the, the previous name or the previous idea from this pronoun, it. What does it reference? Well, if you look back at verse 6, if you have your Bibles there with you, Romans 10 verse 6, you'll see that it is this, the righteousness based on faith speaks, and then it describes how it speaks. So here you have Paul talking about what faith in righteousness looks like. And then in verse 8, he's going to describe what this faith in righteousness looks like. And so here in the first part of the chapter, Paul's more or less saying what faith in righteousness is not. If you look at verses 2 and 3, he is saying, faith in righteousness is not knowledge alone. That's a point that we need to make sure that we are reminded of, and we'll say more about that in a moment. But the righteousness of God is not just knowledge. It's not just knowing a lot of good things. It doesn't stop there, though. If you look at verse 4, he says the righteousness of God is not just the righteousness of the law. So it's not just about knowing, and it's not just about doing, okay? That's what he said at the very beginning here in chapter 10. Faith in righteousness of God being justified by Christ is something far bigger than just knowing and doing. So what is that? Well, look here at verse number 8, and let me give you the first feature here of faith. The first feature of faith is this. Faith requires biblical knowledge of Christ. Now, wait a second, Pastor. You just said from verses 2 and 3 that knowledge alone is not enough. So knowing a lot of good things isn't enough. That's true. That's right. But knowledge is vital. So we have to, we have to balance this. Knowledge is not enough on its own, but catch this. Without knowledge, there can't be faith. You're not? Look here at verse 8. Not only does he talk about what does it speak, and then he quotes Deuteronomy, which we'll get to here in a little bit, but look at the very end of verse 8. He says, he clarifies, that is the word of faith, so there's that word faith, which we are preaching. Paul is already, more than just hinting, he's already speaking that in order to have faith, you must hear the right truth about Christ. There must be accurate biblical proclamation either through the written word or the proclaimed word of Jesus Christ in order for there to be faith. Now, if verse 8 is not convincing to you, I would encourage you to look at verse 14, also of chapter 10, because Paul's not giving up on this idea. Look at verse 14. He's asking a variety of questions, a chain of evangelism, and he says in verse 14, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? Listen to this. How will they believe in him who they have not heard? You hear that? Believing is tied to hearing. And then how will they hear without a preacher? Somebody to proclaim the truth of God's word. The idea here is this. In order 
to have faith, we're going to describe what that faith is, there has to be knowledge of the divine. You have to have knowledge of Jesus Christ. And if you don't have knowledge of Jesus Christ, then you can't have faith in Jesus Christ. And if you're still uncertain of that, I encourage you to look at verse 17. Because you cannot get any clearer than what Paul says in verse 17. So faith comes from hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. Isn't that clear? You must know about Jesus and what Jesus has done and your own spiritual condition of death in your sins before there can be faith of responding to him in belief. And if there's not knowledge of the divine, if there's not knowledge of Jesus Christ, then there is no hope for salvation because you cannot be saved for a problem you do not know you have. You cannot be saved by a savior you don't know of. Now friends, and this is not the point of this sermon, but let me make this very quickly. If that does not light a fire underneath your bones or in your bones or however you want to describe it, to speak the gospel to others, to live and to proclaim Christ, that something's wrong because God has chosen you and me as believers to be the means for the proclamation of the word of God. How dare we think it's somebody else's job to do what God has called us to do? You don't have to have a pulpit. You have to have faith. Your faith came from learning about Christ. It didn't stop there, but you learned about Christ and then something happened in your heart. Let me make, so we have to be balanced on this. You have to have knowledge, but let me also be quick to mention what I referenced at the very beginning, that we cannot think that knowledge alone is enough. There's a bad situation in many churches today, many evangelical churches, where the assumption is, as long as people know about God's word, as long as they can give the right answers, then they're right with God. If all we have is knowledge of Christ, then we have what we might call demonic belief. I'd say, what is that? That's James 2.19. You believe that God is one. Rather critically, James says, you do well. The demons also believe and shudder. Now, that is not a saving belief. Belief and faith are often used interchangeably here. The demons don't believe wholeheartedly, like we're going to talk about here, that Jesus died for their sins, but they have a right understanding of who God is. They do. They have a greater experience of the reality of God than many of us today. They have a greater understanding of the spiritual realm and condition that we do today. They know who God is, and they're terrified. When was the last time you were terrified of God? And yet, that's not enough. Why? Because knowledge isn't the end. It's just the beginning. So you have to have knowledge of Christ, but it doesn't end there, which is why Paul doesn't end there. Let's go back to Romans chapter 10. It starts with knowledge. It doesn't end with knowledge. What else has to be in faith? If it starts with knowledge, the second feature of faith. Not only is knowledge, but something that's implied here in Romans 10, this is in your notes, faith is the believer's response to God's grace. Faith is the believer's response to God's grace. Now, admittedly, the word grace is not here in our text. I will absolutely concede that. But nowhere in the Bible is there any sense that faith and grace are devoid from one another. In fact, what Paul has done here in the book of Romans is he's already articulated faith all the way up until this point, and now he's saying, what does it look like to respond to that? You might remember what we professed earlier from Ephesians chapter 2. Let me remind you of what we said from verse 8. Verse 8 said this, For by grace you have been saved, through faith and not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. There in Ephesians 2a, what Wayne was talking about earlier, these two sola, sola gratia, grace, and then sola fide, grace or a faith alone, that's where these two go together. You must have grace in order to have faith. Where there is grace, there is faith, and where you see faith, there has been grace there. Does that make sense? Now, has Paul been talking about this? You betcha. Romans 5.15, listen to the lead up to our text in the previous chapters. He said, but the free gift, that's talking about grace, is not like the transgression. For if by the transgression of the one, that's Adam, the many died, much more, hear this, did the grace of God and the gift by the grace of one man, the new Adam, Jesus Christ, abound to the many. Do you hear the importance and significance of grace? Right? What Christ 
Christ has done is a work of grace, the free gift that's not like the transgression of sin that separates us from God, but it is that bridge the gap used to draw us a right relationship to God. That is what grace is. Consider Romans 11, 6, which says, For if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works, otherwise grace would not be grace. Here's a silly, perhaps, illustration, but it might help us remember this idea of grace leading to faith. Grace is the rope that a Savior ties around the drowning man in the water, and faith is trusting that that rope will not break as it pulls us to safety. That's the idea of grace and faith working together. Grace is our salvation encircling us in our midst of our death, of our sins, and faith is saying, that's what I need, and that alone is what I need. There must be grace. There must be faith. Martin Luther would put it this way in a sermon entitled, On Faith and Coming to Christ. He said this in 1528. In preaching from John, he said, This faith alone, when based upon the sure promises of God, must save us, as our text clearly explains. And in the light of it all, they must become fools who have taught us other ways to become godly. Man may forever do as he will. He can never enter heaven unless God takes the first step with his word, which offers him divine grace and enlightens his heart so as to get upon the right way. Should one imagine he is able to do anything good of his own strength, he does no less than make Christ the Lord a liar. Friends, where there is faith, the presence of grace is there, and where there is grace, there will always be faith. These necessarily go together. So we've said so far that there must be knowledge of the divine, knowledge of Christ and his redemptive work. There must be the presence of grace, this free gift of God of what Christ has done to save us. But what is then this thing called faith? This is explicitly in our text. Faith is a wholehearted belief in the gospel. Faith is a wholehearted belief in the gospel. Make sure you have your Bibles out, if you would, and look at verse 8. At the very beginning of verse 8, your, your translation should have italics or something to tell you he's quoting from the Old Testament. So he's quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 14. And I'm going to need some help because notice how throughout our text, he's focusing on one area of your life that's going to expand with meaning. Look at verse 8. The word is near you, and I'm going to need help in just a moment, in your mouth and in your where? Say it out really loudly. Now look at verse 9. Believe in your what? Heart. Say it loudly. Heart. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. I bet you know what he's going to say in verse 10, don't you? Verse 10, for with the heart. a person believes. Do you see how the argument that Paul is making repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly is that this faith is something that consumes your heart. It is a deep-seated, to the deepest core of your being, a transformation from what you once were to now what you are in Christ. It is an entrustment. It is a clinging to everything of another for the salvation of yourself. Robert Mounser would put it this way. He talks about faith being wholehearted, saying, to believe with one's heart means to commit oneself at the deepest level to the truth as revealed at experience, and then confession is maybe expression of words to that conviction. So, friends, I have to ask you, I have to ask you, if you claim to have faith, oh yes, I have, I have faith in Jesus Christ, absolutely, Pastor, I have to ask, are you committed in the deepest core of your humanity to Christ? I'm not talking about, was that something that you did at one part of your life and now you've kind of entered into new seasons? I'm not saying whether you've divided your week up to these are holy days and these are obedient days and, well, this is my time and this is what I do. I'm saying, is there a holistic, wholehearted change from the core of your being that works itself out into every expression of your humanity? So often we think, if only I stop doing those things with my hands, if I stop looking upon those things with my eyes, if I stop using my feet in that way, if I stop dwelling upon these things, then I will be right. Paul says, may it never be. It's not about doing. 
It's about your heart being transformed by grace. That is faith. A transformation that is from the very well of your being, the deepest part of humanity, that makes you right in Christ. Now, I want to be very clear here. We've been talking about the gospel. We've been talking about responding to the gospel. I've just said we must wholeheartedly believe, have faith in the gospel. May none of us leave wondering what must I wholeheartedly have faith in. So let me give you a statement that I've compiled together of the core essence of the gospel. This is a significant statement because this is the gospel according to God's word. This is what you must wholeheartedly believe. It goes like this. Salvation is believing Jesus Christ died as payment for your sins. Do you believe that? It's repenting of your sins against the eternal Father. Do you believe that? It's living by the Spirit in the newness of life through Christ's resurrection. Do you believe that? Do you hear how this this has what we need? It's Trinitarian. We have God the Father. We have God the Son. God the Holy Spirit. It has what Christ did when he accomplished our salvation through the payment of your sins and through the resurrection. It has now the response of repentance and believing and then now being changed in the newness of life. I have to ask, is that part of your life? Is that your life? Faith says, I wholeheartedly believe I have nothing except for Christ. He is my only hope. He is all that I have. Charles Spurgeon would put it this way, and this is on the back of your notes, in your insert. Spurgeon would put it this way. I want you to be able to take this home and read it this afternoon should you desire to do so. He said this, My hope lives not because I am not a sinner, but because I am a sinner for whom Christ died. My trust is not that I am holy, but that being unholy, he that is Christ is my righteousness. My faith rests not upon what I am or shall be or feel or know, but in what Christ is and what he has done and what he is now doing for me. And all of God's people should say, Hallelujah. That's the gospel. That's the gospel. And it's not just saying, well, that sounds good. That sounds nice. I'll take a dose of that. It says, I am no longer my own. My life is Christ's. I wholeheartedly believe in that truth of who Christ is and what he's done. There's another feature of the faith here in our text. Not only is it wholehearted, but more explicitly, faith is an inward persuasion with outward evidences. Faith is an inward persuasion with outward evidences. This is quite explicitly in verses 9 and 10 of our text. And I love what Paul's doing here. Paul's talking about the uh, understood or visible describing the invisible. So what I can see and observe, telling me of the things I can't observe. You notice verse 9, and you'll see this very clearly, I think. He says, if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord, notice how that's observable. I can observe what you confess. That then tells me of the unobservable. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, the description of salvation, what you must believe the gospel, you will be saved. Now look at verse 10. So in verse 9, he had talked about the visible telling us of the invisible. Verse 10 switches it. And he tells us of the invisible telling us of the visible. Verse 10, for with the heart, something I can't observe. A person believes, resulting in righteousness, and then with the mouth, he confesses, resulting in salvation. Here's what he's saying. He's saying that if you have changed in your heart, it always must work its way out into every area of your life. Let me tell you what makes no sense, and you've heard me say this before. The New Testament does not have a category for someone who claims to be a Christian and yet is satisfied living in very ungodly ways. That, that, that is not a biblical category for the redeemed. If you are redeemed in Christ Jesus, if you have been given this faith through grace, then you will live like it, you will speak like it. It now has worked its way out from in. And that's what Jesus talked about, by the way. I think that Paul was understanding what Jesus had said, and that's why he's describing this to the church of Rome. Perhaps he was thinking of Jesus in Luke chapter 6, 
verse 45. Listen to what Jesus would say. Jesus said, the good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth what is good, and the evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth what is evil. Listen to this. For his mouth speaks from that which fills his heart. Now that might be trouble for some of us here this morning. Because some of us have so separated, we've so segmented our life that we functionally, this is the part that's God's, this is the part that, you know, it's just not changed yet. So on Sunday mornings, I guard my tongue, but on Monday morning, I'm back at it. Whatever is the easiest. For some of us, perhaps we even don't guard our tongue at any point. Friends, the gospel says, if you have faith, then everything in your life is going to change. Your heart will work its way out. Let me just ask this question. What are your words saying about your heart? Those who were here yesterday at the Biblical Counseling Conference, we talked about husbands and wives. It can be a pretty It can be pretty devastating to realize what's in our hearts by what we say. If I were to shadow you tomorrow, a fly on the wall, would I see faith or would I see the world? Friends, where are you at? Are you confessing Christ and yet living in a very different way? Don't tell me about your heart if your life doesn't match it. But also, don't just tell me about your life if your heart's far from the Lord. The heart must be right, which confesses and lives according to the Word of God. There's another feature of the faith. This is the last feature of the faith before we get to the evidences of faith. The last feature of the faith is this, and this is perhaps the sweetest of all of them. Faith entrusts yourself to a faithful Savior. You see, if we've gotten to this point in the text, oh, yes, Pastor, yes, I am confessing before others and to others my relationship with Christ. It's, it's in my heart, and though I'm not perfect, I strive to be more like the Lord because His grace has so changed me. Then when you get to verse 11, this is the warm blanket of security that comes upon the believer. So hear this, brother and sister in Christ. He says, when he quotes Isaiah 28, 16, whoever believes in the Messiah, that is the anointed one, that is Jesus Christ himself, you will never be disappointed, amen. You will never be put to shame. You will never be left out to where God's not there. You will never be in a place where God has failed you. He cannot fail you. And so if you're in Christ, I don't doubt that you might be going through a valley of life right now. That absolutely happens. But when you're in the valley, or when you're on the mountain, or whatever season you're going through, you must believe, you must look to the one who will not disappoint you, and entrust yourself to a good God who will never fail his promises that he has promised to you. God has promised his love. God has promised his security, eternal security. He has promised his grace. And just like that rope from the drowning man will not break, neither will God's grace, neither will his plan, neither will be what he has promised to you. Now, do you know what sin is in the Christian life? Sin is saying, God, instead of entrusting myself to you, I'm going to entrust myself to an idol. So I worry. So I respond angrily. So I do things that are not good by trying to escape into a show, social media, or a relationship. I try to find my identity in another instead of in Christ. Friends, if we are in a place in life and you are believing in Christ, but you're recognizing that there have been sinful tendencies of looking and entrusting your well-being, your hope, your comfort to something else, to idols. There's only one thing to do. It's to repent of those things and to cling to Christ. This is in your notes. Repentance forsakes 
say at the foot of the cross, faith looks to Jesus alone and believes. Where are the idols in your life that you are looking to for entrusting yourself to? Take it to the cross and leave it there. That heavy backpack's only getting heavier. Your worry only continues brick upon brick upon brick. Drop it at the foot of the cross and look to the one who has not only died for your sins, but he has said, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. You will not forsake you. And trust yourself to a faithful Savior who will never fail. Wayne Grudem would put it this way. The person who genuinely returns to Christ for salvation must at the same time release the sin to which he or she has been clinging and turn away from that sin in order to turn to Christ. Thus, repentance, neither repentance nor faith comes first. They must come together. John Murray, the 20th century Scottish theologian, said this, Penitent faith, believing repentance. Friend, are you clinging to Christ? Or are you clinging to the idols of this world that you think will bring you satisfaction, pleasure, comfort, and hope? We've talked about what faith is, because that's what Paul talked about. This, these are the features or the distinctives of faith. But I want to finish with the evidences of faith. And this is the second and final one. What does this faith look like in your life and in mine? And let me show my hand. I'm not good at poker. Let me show you my hand already. My hope, and the Spirit has to do this, is that if you're here and these things about faith that we've been talking about, they are foreign to you, regardless of what others think of you, that is foreign. Then when we talk about the evidences of faith, you might be so overwhelmed by what the goodness of God is and what he has done, that you might turn to him in faith this morning. And if you are in Christ, that you might be encouraged and strengthened and drive with motivation to have more in faith and respond more in faith in your life. So four evidences of faith, biblically, that must be in your life. First evidence of faith is very simple. Faith is evidence through public profession. Faith is evidenced through public profession of faith. Let me clarify. It does include announcing to a church that you are saved, but it certainly does not end there. How foolish we are to think that if we just announce once, then that's it. How foolish we are to think that faith is just only for me. Have we become so individualistic? That we think that God's working of faith in your individual life is only just for you? You do realize that God has redemptively worked in your heart so that you might proclaim it. That's, that's him. That's part of the kingdom. That is the kingdom. Proclamation of what has happened in your life. How egregious that if you go into most any church here in the United States, and I can speak about us because I'm one of us. We know more about another person's preference of the sports team. We know more about their voting history. We know more about how they spent their last week than we know about their profession of faith. We've got to be in the habit of people that speak of our faith. That's why you have it. God gave you faith to proclaim it. John Calvin would talk about the necessity of proclaiming faith in this way. How convicting is this? It is quite nonsensical, Calvin would say, to insist that there is fire when there is neither flame nor heat. Has our faith grown cold? You can tell me all day there's a fire within your heart. What are you proclaiming? Is there heat? Is there evidence of the fire? Might God do a great work in light of fire in each and every one of us? Second evidence of faith. Not only public profession of faith, but faith is evidenced through genuine love for Christ and anything that grows closer to Christ. Let me put this very simply. Friends, hear this now. If you hear me say nothing else, hopefully you've heard everything else, but remember this. 
Faith is not in an idea. Faith is in a person, and that person is Jesus Christ. Don't ever forget that. The object of your faith is the Son of God, the Anointed One, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ. And if you have faith, then anything that helps you know the person of Jesus better, you ought to be drawn to. So you know what? Sunday mornings, maybe they used to be kind of boring to you. But faith in your heart says, I want to hear more of the word proclaimed. Reading scripture used to be laborious to you, but faith that is light, that has lit a fire up in your heart says, I see Jesus across every page of scripture, Genesis to Revelation. Faith, when it manifests in your life, it now wants to be discipled and to disciple others. It wants to live a prayerful life because you're communing with Jesus Christ and it wants to fellowship with other believers who love your beloved as well. Faith is in Jesus, not an idea. Is your faith in Jesus? If so, are you drawn to the things of Christ? I've always wondered why it makes any sense. We can have heavy attendance when we do something that's really fun, but when we meet together for prayer or for opening the word, so few come. Why is that? What does that say about my heart? What does that say about ours? Spurgeon would put it this way. If Christ is not all to you, Christ is not all to you, he's nothing to you. He will never go into partnership as a part savior of men. If he be something, he must be everything. And if he be not everything, he is nothing to you. Is Jesus everything to you? Third evidence of faith. Faith is evidence through full submission to the Lordship of Christ. Full submission to the Lordship of Christ. Look quickly at verse 9 of our text. It's the last thing that I'll reference here in our text. It's not an accident, it's not incidental that Paul says about Jesus, Curios, Lord. That word curios translated as Lord means literally master, the one who exercises absolute ownership rights over another. When you have faith in Jesus Christ, Galatians 2.20 is your life verse. It's no longer I who live, but I have died with Christ, and he is now my life because of the love of the Father through Jesus Christ the Son. Have you died to your life, and are you alive in Jesus? If so, you're no longer following, pursuing the silly passions of this world. Money? Don't need it. Affirmation from man? No thank you. Accolades? Cars? Houses? No thank you. I have everything in my Jesus. And he's my Lord. He's my master. I'm his slave. And whatever he calls me to do, I joyfully obey because now my desires are his desires. What he desires are what I want to follow. Is Jesus your master, your Lord? Are you submitting to him today? One final evidence of faith. And this is what we're going to close with. Faith is evidenced through progressively conforming to the image of Christ. Oh, friends, would you examine yourself honestly today and ask yourself, are you living a life that is consistent with the progression of becoming more like Jesus? Romans 8, 29 says, that's why God saved you, so that you might become more into the image of the Son. Jesus, the example that we are to follow. Hebrews chapter 12. Friends, are you becoming more like Christ? If you're here and you're a believer, let me make this as explicitly clear as I can. That must be your life mission. Husbands, your life mission must be to pursue Christ and to help your wife pursue and know Christ and be conformed to his image. Wives, your life mission must be to pursue Christ and encourage your husband 
to be conformed to the image of Christ. Parents, your life mission to your children must be to teach them about the image of Christ, modeling that for them. Grandparents, get your grandkids ice cream and get them wonderful gifts, but show them the image of Christ and teach it to them. And church, are you listening? We must be proclaiming and demonstrating to a lost and dying community around us the image of Christ. If we do anything less than that, then we have failed. Doesn't matter how many people are here on Sunday morning. Doesn't matter how many people we have conversations with. If we're not showing them Christ because we are becoming more like Christ, then we fail. Oh, church, let's not fail. Let's be a church that is individually conforming to the image of Christ so that congregationally, corporately, we are modeling Christ. And when we go into the neighborhoods, we proclaim Christ, they see that something's different. That's a successful church. That's a church that is a spirit-filled church. And friends, if you're here this morning, and this faith is foreign, that's not what I, that's not what I knew. That's not what I signed up for back when I walked the aisle. Friends, if you are here and you don't know this Jesus, you can. You can. You can. But it's not a new hat for you to put on today and take off tomorrow. It's a brand new life by looking to Him and to Him alone for the forgiveness of your sins. You want to know the gospel? That's the gospel. How do we respond to the gospel? Through repentance and faith. Here in a moment, we're going to sing a song of reflection. Now, I normally don't stand up here and beckon anyone to come, but if God is working in your heart, you can come and pray with me here on the front pew, or you can come to me afterwards. You can say, Pastor, I need to talk about something with you. I'd love to talk about that with you. There's somebody around you that you might know, you might feel more comfortable with. Talk to them about what needs to be repented of and how you can cling to Christ going forward. Friends, God is at work when the word is prepared. Let's be a church that clings to Christ so that we might have the life in his son and in his son alone. Let's pray. Father, there's just always so much more to say. There's so many things that could have been so much more clearly said. Father, we lay this worship service as an offering of praise to you so that you might receive it, that you might be glorified by it. In our hearts, oh, they're yours, Lord. You've created us. You've sent your Son to die for us. You've sent grace into our hearts. Oh, Lord, you are our everything, because without you we have nothing. So, Father, in whatever way is necessary, might you work to bring many sons and daughters to repentance and salvation. So those of us who are already in your name might be strengthened and grow in our faith by clinging to you, loving you, and serving you. We pray these things in that beautiful name of Jesus. Amen. Friends, our song of reflection is I am thine, O Lord. What an appropriate song to sing. Father, I'm yours. If you mean that, sing it loudly. Sing it like you mean it because you're like is hidden in Christ. If the Lord is doing something in your heart, do not neglect it, but respond, Lord, what will you have me do by seeking him and following him in obedience? Let's stand and let's sing our song of reflection. I am thine, O Lord. If you would be not near in Christ, that's where there's safety. That's where there's hope. That's where there's comfort. Friends, thank you so much for being here this morning. Let me remind you, if you're a member of the church, please give your offerings and tithes on the way out. We are thankful that you've been here. We hope that as you leave here, you will be blessed. But we're going to do one final thing. We're going to sing a song, uh, just a verse in the chorus. It's going to be a cappella. You know that we love a cappella. We're going to sing a song that demands an answer. Are you washed in the blood of Jesus Christ? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Friends, if you haven't, come to know him today. Respond as the Lord leads. Thank you for being here. Let's sing our way out. Are you washed in the blood? Thank you.